Hi everyone, my name is Katya and I'm the producer of Stroka Institute. I'm happy to welcome you all to the public interview with Ippolito Pistolini and Sofia Pierbilenki. Thank you for joining us tonight. The lecture will be in English and there will be no translation. In the beginning of the event, Ippolito will screen his recent movie, Riders Not Heroes, a video from a project developed by his practice 2050+. The video will be followed by the interview, moderated by Sofia Pierbilenki. Ippolito is an architect and curator based in Milan. Currently, he teaches at the Royal College of Arts in London and previously has worked as an architect and partner at OMA. Also, Ippolito is curating the Russian Pavilion for the 2021 Venice Architecture Biennale and has recently founded his agency 2050+. Sofia Pierbilenki is an architect from New York, currently based in Milan. She completed her BFA at Bard College in 2011 and continued her studies at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University, then Architecture Association, and then Stroka Institute as a part of the New Normal program. Currently, Sofia works as a researcher and designer at Space Caviar. Sofia Ippolito, I will pass the word to you. Hello. Okay, I start. Well, it's very nice uh, to be here, and thank you for the invitation, of course. Um, we thought to start with a little movie, which we premiered um, a few days ago. Um, and the movie, in a way, uh, situates both the interests of our practice, but also um, uh, it's, it's a way to reflect on the current or recently past uh, weeks. Um, it was basically made uh, as a desktop movie reflecting on the conditions of food delivery riders in uh, Milan. Um, and somehow the film or the urgency to um, work on this movie, on this research, uh, emerged from the frustration of being stuck at home and be turned into somehow some sort of a touchless subjects while a pretty big chunk of a different kind of population was actually out there in the streets keeping in a way, our social infrastructure intact. Um, I don't know, maybe Sofia, you want to say something before we screen the movie? The movie is 30 minutes long, so it's a little bit longer, um, but it somehow it, we thought it's a nice way to kick off this uh, conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. I've already seen a sneak peek, so, um, but it's very powerful work. I'm happy to see you again. We should say that the movie premiered in, um, in um, AA visiting summer school that Sofia curated in the beautiful hills of Toscany. Um, it was actually <laughs> shown there for the first time in a completely unusual context for the subject that it's actually touching upon. So I'm going to share my screen and then mute my, my microphone okay. and see you in a few minutes. Between March and May 2020, the city of Milan was put under a strict lockdown due to the outbreak of COVID-19. Food delivery riders working for big tech platforms played a huge role in this context. To record this historical moment, we collaborated with an Italian writer and artist, Lupo Borgonovo. Avere una telecamera addosso ti porta a vedere con gli occhi in maniera diversa perché hai un'attenzione che è proprio su quello che la telecamera sta riprendendo, quindi la realtà si raddoppia. Ci sono degli algoritmi che gestiscono i nostri movimenti nella città, che mettono insieme ristoratore, rider e cliente. Questa dimensione dell'algoritmo, di questo movimento, che è sintetica, che è fibra, che è eterea, ma ma tecnologica viene elaborata da me come una dimensione quasi da deriva situazionista. Milan is the national capital of food delivery with an estimated number of 3000 riders working across the city. More than half of them are migrants, 40% from Africa, 15% from Asia, 5% from South America. When the city was totally empty, riders were the only people who kept moving around what then resembled the ghost town, until their social functions finally started to be recognized. From being invisible, they finally got to be seen. 
A steep increase in the demand of delivery services during the lockdown, combined with the massive presence of undocumented workers, has brought to the surface a number of worrying cases of illegal gang mastering. Uber has promised it will be offering food deliveries by drone in multiple countries by 2023. Human friction is replaced by touchless efficiency, labor by information, protests by coding. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this really important work and powerful work with us. I think um, not just as a document of this historic moment we're in, but also the video could become a tool for advocacy and um, sharing of this information. Um, I think through this film, we really revealed this city that maybe we had never seen from this perspective when we were locked inside in our homes during quarantine, it exposed this network of platform delivery, of automation, of applications, and even more importantly, the human lives that support and run these platforms and systems. I think um, it's a thing that often goes hidden, um, that only in this particular moment in time when everything else closed and the streets emptied, except for these riders, um, all the other noise of the city sort of faded away and we were finally able to see and read the infrastructure of these applications more clearly. And through this film with the personal narratives, we kind of understand and this entanglement that is otherwise quite complicated to read um, between the digital and physical realm. Um, so I, I really appreciate this work and thank you for sharing it with us again. Um, I was thinking that this intersection between the um, physical and digital is often a theme in your work, from your studio of Data Matter at Royal College of Art that investigates and researches the physicality of digital networks um, and post-human architectures to the work your studio has done also of designing data centers in Saratov. Um, your practice really develops research that connects pedagogy and practice at many scales and platforms. And I was wondering if you could speak about all of these three projects from education projects to built architecture to research of um, this project like the, of the riders and how they work in relationship to one another in the ways that you see connections between data and material world. Yeah, I mean, um, well, th thank you. Uh, um, I I'm really glad you like the movie. Um, like I said, I think it's important to, for us at least to understand technology, not as a frictionless entity, but something that basically obviously has very uh, material and sometimes mortal consequences. And at the end of the chain of automation, we already discussed this, there are often bodies or mortal bodies, such as in this case. And what um, in, in, this, in the context of an, a very extreme lockdown, such as the one that we have experienced in Milan, I think the inequalities and social fractures um, that are present, and they were present also before the lockdown, before the, um, the outbreak of COVID-19, emerged strongest than ever, basically. Society was clearly split in two groups, like I said, touchless subjects, us basically turning to fingers, tapping on keyboards or on screens or typing very often our credit card numbers. And those actually were kind of keeping the machine running. And I think at one point after a first uh, almost romantic uh, attitude towards the lockdown, towards quarantine, uh, I, we started to realize that of course that we were kind of looking at at this from an extremely privileged situation. Not that we didn't know, but we just wanted to somehow build a narrative uh, almost through a journalistic perspective 
they would actually uh, present the issue uh, in a different way. So not just as scattered news, but rather has one entity, one, one entire narrative. And um, it's actually interesting. I mean, we are an architecture office in principle, but this video will play um, next uh, in the next days in onto uh, political and journalistic platforms in Italy, which is great, obviously, because we were able to transcend in a way the limits of our discipline. So actually to use our discipline to say something else. Um, going back to your question, um, the studio which we run together with Marina Otero Verziere and Camille Dalkir at the Royal College of Art is called Data Matter. And like you said, it looks very much in general at the entangled relationship between data and the material world. And it started with a very concrete perspective, meaning um, the way the infrastructure of data intersects physical space and its implications in terms of resources, energy, uh, physical presence, of course, and um, politics eventually. But then this question somehow expanded. Uh, it became more complicated um, and it became something that was tackling in the way data, machines, their historical development and planning were reflecting biases in terms of gender or race, um, the, the way they were affecting political systems, the way they were able to reformulate, to redesign policies, institutions, and in this case, labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe reaching the latest developments of the studio, the way actually data is crucial in the setup of a potential multi-species um, uh, constituency, which is something that we are kind of trying to develop right now at the end of the first three-year cycle of our studio. Um, the work that I developed in, in Russia, uh, in Saratov, for the design of a data center was very exciting because it was the first, it was a few years ago, actually, the, the project was cancelled uh, due to a change in legislation of the way data is actually, has to be stored in, uh, in Russia. Um, it was basically a sort of fast track way to enter this domain as architects and you know like for architects it's very difficult to sit in those industries where architects are not present so we had to change completely our mind and it became a very interesting investigation about the infrastructure of data where something that i i often refer to a very beautiful text by tiziana terranova who is a media theorist based in naples at the orientale and she mentioned basically at one point in one of her writings that the relationship between back end and front end, between front end and back end of digital interfaces, digital platforms such as you know social networks such as Facebook or, or Google on a larger scale, is the same in architecture. Basically, corresponds to their super colorful, open, transparent headquarters, sort of a playground scape of office work. And on the other side, the back end is this kind of invisible boxes of the data centers where actually our data is aggregated and extracted. So uh, the work in itself became a way to rethink or like to renegotiate this relationship, um, um, but also to rethink the negotiation between um, you know, the data center itself and its context, but also the relationship between uh, maybe uh, human and machine environments for an infrastructure that obviously has most of its space is dedicated to machines. So where human presence is absolutely accidental, almost useless, you might say. Actually, I have an image. If you want, I can share it uh, if, you, if you like. Um, it's this thing um, where it was basically uh, assembled as a sort of uh, module or system of modules where human space was sitting at the center of machine space. And what we wanted to tackle was basically um, um, the access or the redundancy of infrastructure so that the module in itself is something, it's like a fixed unit that could be replicated or could stay on its own so that you wouldn't have to have to build these huge boxes um, before filling them up in time with server space. So. It was a rather efficient or adaptable way to look at the problem. And obviously we had to turn into engineers in order to, uh, to basically uh, develop this project, but rather we had to basically try to, uh, in a way, bring spatial thinking um, 
to a context where this that kind of thinking was not really present. So um, it took us a lot a long time to actually reach a result that was equally efficient, both in terms of human to machine relationship, but also in terms of what the data center was meant to be. So this kind of efficient mm -hmm. machine. And unfortunately, it, it got it got uh, canceled because of this change of regulation, which um, in turn brought to a lowering of the level of technology that we could implement. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, what does that mean? The lowering of well, basically, because we had to keep more data, um, the quality of the technology that we could use was less sophisticated. So instead of designing a tier five data center, meaning extremely developed and fast that DC, we had to go back and design a tier three, which is not as an efficient machine as tier five. So tier five are like this kind of super recent generation of DCs. So now I'm entering into my architectural <laughs> mind in a way, but uh, I do this kind of schizophrenic shift very often, unfortunately. But um, and that basically uh, led to a drop of investment and a drop of interest in a way in developing something that would have worked almost like a prototype in itself, something that you could repeat also in many areas of the world with higher efficiency and uh, less energy consumption, but also less material consumption and so forth. Um, what really like the studio um, in a way led us into, and I think that's the most interesting um, transformation in terms of also the way our practice work is that since few years now we are looking into scales which are not architectural any longer. Um, we look into scales that go from chemical reactions to planetary systems why architecture until a few years ago or like maybe a couple of decades ago was actually really dealing uh, with a, a rather limited range of scales. Maybe the EMS with the power of 10 were really the first ones unveiling the complexity of the world that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's really becoming practice for us. We have to be able to speak to, with those people who are actually dealing with the microscopic scales or the planetary microscopic scales. And it doesn't mean that we are the one driving the process, but at least we have enough knowledge to participate in those processes. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, I think. Um, for, for my practice also, that's the type of work I'm interested in, in being a part of. Um, so I, I'm curious, because I know today you're also uh, launching a, a new project um, that I wanted to talk to you a bit about. So I'm thinking about a lot, we're here online and online so often these days, so many Zooms and everyone comes together in conversation. I don't know where all of our viewers are from, but I'm guessing multiple international locations and it's kind of exciting in a way that we can all um, be here together in this space, although a bit sad that we're not in Russia together on the stage. Um, but I think more than ever, we're seeing that this space of the online and offline are becoming blurred, the office, um, it's unclear if you're at work when you're at home now, um, even more so than ever before. And a lot of the programming, um, similarly, has been shifted online that was planned for this year, including your work with the Russian Pavilion Open. And today, uh, you're launching an online video game in relationship to this um, pavilion, and I'm I'd like to hear more about like the decision of the medium of the video game. Um, I'm, I, I'd love to hear more about the game to start with and then have more okay. questions. Well, um, I mean, maybe I'll make a small introduction, then we can navigate okay. part of the website and then I can play the trailer or anyone who's online can actually access the website and play the trailer, download the game and so on. So uh, maybe there's a little premise to be done. Um, the game or this game specifically, or well, not this version of the game, but a game was part of the original plan. So um, it was part basically of the program that we announced now a few months back uh, before the biannual was postponed, before the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, before we knew that we would have spent most of our time on Zooms <laughs> meetings like this one. Um, but obviously those, uh, let's say, part of the program, which are based on immaterial 
works, or digital works, and not just this game by Michael Maximov, but also uh, the beautiful um, in the same bot chatbot by Lionel Unicorn, was basically they they gain a new centrality, a new role with the decision that we took before knowing that the Biennial would have been postponed in 2021 to migrate the entire program, to migrate the entire program online. Um, at the time, uh, before we knew to migrate online, the game was basically an acknowledgement that the dimension of gaming is one among many other ways of being together. And, you know, we belong to different generations, but of course, if we pose these questions to people um, from Generation Z or even earlier, I mean, gaming or digital environments are a routine. It's their maybe new political space or new space of congregation. So there is nothing too strange in the decision to actually, um, or too new in a way to actually focus on a game for the, in, this, in, in this situation. Um, this game specifically though uh, became very important because basically it somehow reflects on the core question of the Russian pavilion, which is to investigate the public role of cultural institutions in time of global crisis, which is a question that became even more urgent during COVID-19. Um, and somehow what we wanted to do is also to understand what other institutions are possible, what other forms of collectiveness are possible beyond a human-centric perspective. And the game or the game that Maximum developed somehow looks at notion of transhumanism and posthumanism. And they are explored through a sort of magical performance that takes place actually in the Giardini of the Banyol around the Russian pavilion in a sort of post-apocalyptic uh, scenario where a character somehow mutates between different kind of uh, statuses by meeting other characters. So it is sometimes a bot, sometimes a human-like figure, but without gender, sometimes it's a virus. Um, and the idea somehow was to explore through the performance of the game, you know, what other kind of interspecies communication we can actually establish. Because most importantly, because obviously the pandemia and the crisis associated with it brought to the foreground the need, of course, to engage in a different way um, in our sort of interspecies relationships. Um, the game itself uh, somehow, uh, or, or maybe more, more broadly, the idea to migrate online became most, most importantly for us a way to explore both a different format of exhibition or of curatorship, but also a different kind of environment. So in the absence of the physical pavilion, the game doesn't replace the physical pavilion, but it offers a different take, a different narrative interpretation of the pavilion, of the Giardini, of the way the pavilion can actually be used and narrated. And there are also beautiful moments where uh, you will see it maybe in the trailer where somehow the character can access the website of the pavilion from inside the game and navigate the pavilion website. So us as human audience access the same content than a fictional non-human character actually can see from inside the pavilion. So there are moments of intersections which we think are quite powerful in explaining what is the potential of a platform like this. Although this is for now a single player game, so you cannot play simultaneously with more people, um, but it will be released on Steam uh, in, on the 15th of July. And so in a way it will be even more public than what it is at the moment. But let me maybe uh, play quickly the screen so that you can see a little bit uh, what I'm talking about. So this is basically our homepage where the most recent uh, projects are actually displayed as windows over a calendar. The projects or every single contribution is basically uploaded um, chronologically. So there are weekly updates for those who don't know the project. So this is basically a little trailer.
crazy. Yeah, so the game obviously has some kind of, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's a genre in itself, and therefore there are also some seeds which are typical from war zone gaming, but we really wanted to engage with the format, with the genre per se. Mm -hmm. So in order to open a different kind of dimension to the overall narrative of the pavilion, it's also the only moment where the pavilion and our digital platform actually appears. Yeah. Um, I, I've been asked, for example, several times after we moved the program online, whether we would have produced a very complex digital, you know, <laughs> reconstruction sort of digital yeah. surrogate of the pavilion to place the exhibition there and it was really far away from our intention what we wanted to basically do was to unpack what was meant to be as an exhibition into an editorial and research project and to give it a time to give it a calendar and to use really the pavilion as a sort of uh, archive in the making for the future edition of the biennial or or longer or even you know looking beyond that the temporality the game itself though of course opens something which is very interesting is that you can create your own notion of time mm. and then you can basically uh you know like um, operate in, in a sort of a time capsule which is independent from the chronology of the pavilion uh, and that is probably the most interesting narrative aspect of it and um it it, it somehow um, unlocks a certain potential in terms of using a digital reconstruction or a digital environment for much more than just showing the surrogate of what was meant to be as an exhibition. Right, right. That's true. And, and will there ever be any sort of overlap between what happens in the digital thing and the physical pavilion? Well, I mean, for now, until 2021, uh, the game will stay um, as it is, although um, for, although basically um, the idea is that many, many of you probably know that the pavilion is under reconstruction at the moment. There was a call, the call was won by a young office. So the pavilion is changing and the game will register all these changes. Mm -hmm. So the narrative might become more complex, there might be new characters emerging, but the architecture in itself will adapt to the project of transformation that is happening in real life. Um, you didn't see it in the trailer, but if you actually download the game and you play it, uh, there are several mirrors in a way between reality and the digital environment. For example, originally, uh, we had planned to have through the summer a screening movie festival curated in collaboration with Vladimir Vadien and the Moscow Experimental Film Festival. Uh, Vova put together an amazing program and in the context of rethinking institutions, we thought that hosting a young institution was part of that program. Uh, it was supposed to be happening in the gardens behind the pavilion, the one facing the lagoon. And of course, with the postponement of the biennial and the pandemia, we could not do it. But in the game itself, there is the place of the movie screening. So you, as a character, you can actually go there and see some of the movies which are screened now on the Pavilion website. Nice, nice. So there are all these kind of mirrors or reminders between what is actually happening on the platform and what is actually happening on the game, but also what is happening in the game and what is happening in real life. Really nice. I think it's a very interesting idea to use this as a design tool also like of course, every platform we use, every tool we use, like CAD versus Rhino, versus now a video game engine as a as a as a tool for designing architecture, or designing scenarios or events, and kind of positioning ourselves into that space is it's very interesting. I I want to play it. I want to try. It. Yeah. No, I mean, gaming engine gaming engines are really an interesting tool specifically for the time factor which we were discussing and the construction of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something, for example, that other architectural, typically architectural software such as CAD or Rhino have much, much, much less, yeah. or they can simulate in a much less effective way. So I think the introduction of the notion of time within our design tools, it's actually uh, maybe one of the most interesting impacts that the gaming industry can actually brought to architecture but at the same time you know maybe this meeting that we are having could have been designed in a different way i mean the design of zoom is extremely limited in what we can do i mean i see you 
through a window on in the background of your room and I see all these other people either as names or either as you know um, people in a room and I wonder and that's also something that we were trying to explore this year actually at the Royal College of Arts what if as architects participate in the design of this platform but from a spatial perspective and what can we actually achieve I mean at the end if this will be the future of our political interaction we also need a space that is actually responding to this eye um, challenge. Yep, yep. Oh, I think precisely that. And this is the moment to rethink the practices and the tools and the, the way we work together. Also, I think this pause in a way has given us the opportunity to shift our thinking. And like you, you so quickly reacted to the situation and were able to find ways that um, this online platform and this online programming could not just be a, I don't know, an alternative or a second best option, but instead sort of become an extension and um, push further the kind of thinking that you were developing, which. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, to tack on that, I think, you know, we never understood the platform as just an extension of the project. The, pl the platform is really the project. Yeah, the only yeah. thing is that, you know, there is a shift in the curatorial approach from designing and putting together an exhibition, curating an exhibition that you experience all at once in a moment, in a space, and space plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. And instead, the transition into an online program that unfolds through six months it turns basically the same exhibition into an editorial and research platform. The advantage though is that because we don't work with the limits of physical space, that we could expand the project. The game itself changed radically, it became something else through the past months. We added a program, a program called Voices with over 40 people contributing with perspectives about the future of institutions. And all of this will basically set the foundation for what will be the pavilion in 2021 although the pavilion 2021 will not feature necessarily this content it okay. will not be a collector it will be a step two mm -hmm. but the opportunity that we had was to use the platform as a sort of engine to produce new thinking hopefully fantastic yeah i mean i think something that we've talked about a lot is is exactly this that i think the idea of the architect or the architect studio um, of just designing a, a just buildings or as the sort of figurehead architect but instead um, your practice the way of thinking is seeing architecture as a more of a galaxy of relationships and the architect is a cultural agent where you're looking at intertwined supply chains ripple effects policy design the material footprints and and design really at a planetary scale um, architecture becomes a cultural ecosystem, a studio that becomes a company of companies. Um, I'm really interested in how your practice takes a curatorial practice and brings it also as, into a research platform, such as Monditalia, Manifesta 12, and now with the Russian Pavilion. Um, but I'd like specifically if you could talk a bit about your new practice 2050 plus and the sort of work that you see emerging from this in relationship to curating and research um, and the architect as a as a galaxy of practice mm. yeah i mean it's um well i think there are two factors uh to be taken in consideration the first one is that architecture is maybe not enough mm -hmm. to understand certain complexities, but also to respond to the urgencies that we are dealing with. The second is that architecture in itself is rather limited also in terms of market appeal, at the moment at least. There are other domains which are somehow um, maybe more interesting or more effective either on tackling certain subjects or urgencies either also responding on market inputs so what when i left oma i left oma let's say in january because i felt that the model 
was somehow not adaptable enough to recurring uh, crisis or to recurring needs. 2050 Plus is not an agency and it's not a studio, it's a platform. So it's basically, um, well, I mean, in, broadly we work across design, politics, environment and technology, which is more or less also what we research with the Royal College of Arts. Uh, but it's a place where more disciplines are kind of meeting. Um, I have a very expansive notion of architecture. So to me, construction is, on, is only one side of being an architect. Um, and what we tried to do was to basically use the tools of special investigation to actually uh, be able to be in discussion with other disciplines. And that implies one major shift, I think, in the mind of an architect to basically abandon the pedestal of authorship and to position yourself transversally as a sort of point in a network of many knowledges. So you can be part of the design of a digital infrastructure such as a data center, but most likely you will not drive the process. You can sit at the planning table or at the table of policymakers but you are only bringing your perspective. You are not driving the process, most likely. Um, you can design a video game <laughs> eventually, or the sp spatial configurations of a video game, but most likely you will not be alone there. So the idea that we wanted to basically implement is to be able to gain enough exchange with other disciplines in order to basically um, being able to trespass in a way the boundaries of our of what architects can do and being able to intercept domains that architects normally uh, don't intercept. And 2050 Plus is built in terms of model as a sort of, um, it's part of a company of companies. I think this is your definition actually. I love that. Um, because basically I am uh, somehow the founder and director of 2050 Plus, but I'm also partner um, of other smaller agencies um, that deals with art direction, communication, film production, uh, or educational projects. And I'm not the person who's actually directing those companies, but I'm part of the conversation. And what we can do somehow is to bring together our resources and intercept maybe uh, a more diverse um, plethora of projects like that. So there is also, in a way, you know, Reality is queering, but also the work is queering. So it's very difficult to basically operate just as an architect. You're always asked to bring in something else. At least that's my experience. And we've been working with, for example, the project, the Riders project, um, emerged as a spin-off of a larger project with the, that we are developing with Nike in Milan that looks at new forms of urban movement beyond sports. And riders are one. Then, of course, we made it into a very political, maybe, film. But they came to us to look basically at, at the intersection between movement and city from a different perspective, something that eventually other agencies were not able to do. Um, and I'm not operating as an architect. I'm operating basically as an observer in this case. Um, but that's just an example of the kind of work that we we sometimes bring to the table in the in the office. Um, and yeah, in a way, I mean, in, in, from a very pragmatic perspective, it was also a way to respond to um, yeah the inputs of the market. And then our experience in terms of uh, curatorial practices, you know, I work on the pavilion with uh, two colleagues in 2050 plus, and one is Giacomo Ardesio. Um, and the other one is Erika Petrillo, who is actually trained as a curator, differently from me, in fact. Um, but curating has a lot to do with, in a way, special practices. It's about orchestrating content in space, and it, it's about designing relationships. Sometimes some architects design spaces, but you can also design relationships. And in that sense, every single curatorial effort that we uh, took on was a way somehow to test our special thinking against other forms of content. And uh, although it sounds extremely schizophrenic, and sometimes it is, there is a common denominator to all of this. And for us, it's very clear. Fantastic. 
No, I'm, I love, I love what you're doing already. And I think it's so great that you're, you've come back to Milan and I can't wait to see all that unfolds in the 2050 and beyond years. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, I, I think it's now a good time. We, we've got a lot of questions already ahead of time. And I think um, Katya wrote to everyone that if you have questions, you can actually raise your hand in this weird way by like pressing a button and then it, it, uh, there's an explanation of how to do it, but it's not like raising a little hand, but it's a button you press. Anyways, you can ask questions in that way, or I can start with maybe some of the questions that people sent ahead of time. Um, so just to start from, is that okay? Ipo, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. so to start with, from Vasya Bansinkin, um, asked, what prompted you to propose the renovation of the pavilion as a feature of the coming Biennale? Uh, what prompted um, you to propose the reconstruction or renovation itself? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the process is very long, but um, uh, in fact, the renovation was or the need of a renovation is something that I found in the process. So when I was called in, I was asked also to deal with this. Um, and the way we, we decided to deal with this, together with the commissioner and the whole team around the pavilion, was to launch an open call. And the reconstruction of the pavilion became rather quickly a reflection, on, a wider reflection on the reconstruction of the institution of the pavilion. And by scaling that up on the role of cultural institutions in these times. So um, I wouldn't say that the reconstruction is my idea. The reconstruction is needed because the pavilion is very damaged and there, were, there was an urgent need of refurbishment. So we, we turned that into the trigger for the whole project. But the, for me, at least I think that impulse of the, the project becoming a working site, something that is always in flux that gives um, an agency and a new project to a young emerging practice was really exciting. And to see, to never come into the pavilion and it always is being a work in progress, it's always changing. Um, I think this will be really exciting. And you know, I mean, the point since the beginning, and then of course, I mean, everything happened in between with the website and so forth, yeah. is that I think the main question was how to go beyond an exhibition. You know how to go beyond uh, the pavilion is an empty shell. It is filled every two years with content. And finished. I'd rather look into a longer temporality where you can build from one edition to the other to the other. And in this case, originally it was supposed to be like a living working site where many things would have happened, obviously in parallel to the working site. Um, but the same attitude will be kept also from next year on in the sense that we will not make an exhibition it will be a work in progress but of a different kind okay yeah that kind of links to Anne Ka's question that if you've had to rethink the concept of the pavilion for 2021 if it's if it's changing at all um from what you expected I mean of course some things I you've already explained that the public program you're putting forward online will not just be simply then put in person um, next year, but um, I'm sure this has allowed for a reflection on what you want to put forward and given you more time in a way to. But I, th I think the main issue here is about the basically um, how to build an institution mm -hmm. that is not just temporary, that is able to basically do more than just opening a door for exhibitions but rather to re-engage re with an audience with the local context and so forth. And there are multiple strategies to do that. Um, I cannot say much at the moment, but what I, what, uh, what I can say is that the project of 2021 will be a natural development of this one, but it will not be a re-edition of the online platform. Um, Eugenio Superti. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Reflecting on the role of the architect in 2020, in this particular moment, do you see architects more as researchers, architects as designers, or architects as designers of the research? Both. 
I, I, don't, I, I mean, I, in, my, in my opinion, there is never a different, I mean, if you're an architect, you're always a researcher and vice versa, in a way, you can design also your research or the way your research is narrated. I think the Rider is, is a very special project in a way. Um, what I do think is that maybe, uh, I mean, the outbreak um, will generate an enormous crisis, mm -hmm. but it will generate an enormous crisis of old structures and old economies in a way, but it will open up enormous possibilities. There is an entire world that we need to redesign, um, new policies, new digital platforms, new spaces, and we will have to coexist with the risk, um, very tangible risk of other pan pande pandemic outbreaks in the future. And I, I, I see a totally central role for architects, um, also in the redefinition of our relationship to material resources, and to the planet in general, to um, so in a way, whatever we think as a crisis is for us, I think a huge space of opportunity. So I, but that implies, I think, not to uh, separate the relationship between research and, and architecture. I think they, they totally collide. They must. I guess that kind of links in a way you said it, but, uh, uh, Shropen Z is wondering what the biggest challenge would will be for architecture today. If you could name one of the the challenges that we face today, what which feels the most pressing to you in this moment? Well, I mean, I think on top of this chain of events, it's yeah. the climate emergency. So our relationship to the planet to whatever is left of biodiversity, um, the new frontiers of the oceans. Exactly. The, I mean, and I had actually a very interesting discussion with uh, Nikolai from Strelka uh, mm -hmm. about this and, you know, the need also to understand, um, to really fuel our, um, in a way, um, operations also towards higher degrees of artificiality we had a nice and interesting discussion about food and artificial meat. People will not go vegan, eh? <laughs> definitely not around the world, but we, we will have to basically compensate with different technologies the need for, you know, the food that we are used to, but other parts of the world uh, have not been exposed to or they were not able to reach. And this is just a small example somehow. I think, um, you know, there is a very strange narrative, especially mainstream media, that on one side is asking for transformations and different kind of attitudes. On the other side, it's really not looking at the scale of the issue. And once you collide these two things, there is no way that we can actually um, avoid to deal with this through, uh, let's say, a very effective entanglement and collaborations between politics and technological development. And design. And design, of course. That sits in between. <laughs> exactly. Um, Katya, do we have any hands raised? There, no, not yet. Um, I, I mean, I think in a way, Ipo has answered a lot of most of these questions we received ahead of time. I, a sweet question from Nika Sabat. Um, what it, several questions like this, actually. What advice do you have for young students graduating this year, I guess. It's kind of sweet. Well, I, yesterday, yesterday I had um, Zoom drinks with my students. Nice. <laughs> a super depressive uh, moment, actually. Uh, don't do Zoom drinks. They're really depressive, you know. <laughs> but um, but um, I, in, in, we were really discussing the same things. And um, um, obviously, whoever graduated in 2020 graduated in a sort of annus horribilis. Um, but at the same time, I think, it's, I think and I hope it's completely evident and clear that to go to work for a traditional architectural practice is not the horizon that we need to look for. It might seem safe, it might seem um, maybe the right thing to do, but uh, it, it's not really dealing with the present moment. Um, so our advice, for example, in their case, they're all based in London, although they're not all from London, is to leave 
the UK, which tends to be very commercial in terms of architectural practices and actually explore other parts of Europe and find practices where they can really act across scales and across disciplines and hopefully in, uh, in very uh, or more urgent, on, on more urgent challenges than, you know. Completely agree. I guess everyone come to Milan. Well, <laughs> nice or forming here. So, yeah. Um, oh, I have a question uh, from another Sofia Batisina. How would Zoom look if it was designed by architects? Very interesting. <laughs> well, probably a grid would be there, um, but uh, you know. My comment before, uh, Zoom is interesting in the sense of the construction of these kind of continuous interiors or collage of interiors scenes. Uh, so the interface in itself opens up quite an interesting uh, uh, conversation about space. On the other hand, I find it very limited in what you can do. You know, um, I find it very limited in, in terms of what you can share. I mean, we basically are stuck in this kind of a technical aquarium, you know, and we are kind of always behind the screen. There is never a three-dimensional understanding of our conversation or so maybe, maybe, um, I don't know whether it's, it's Zoom or another platform, um, something that is in between Zoom and a sort of three-dimensional gaming environment would unlock certain potentials and maybe it would allow us to engage in this conversation in a different way. And getting back to more in-person things, I, I, I'm all for just getting rid of Zoom and coming back in person. I can't wait for that day. Absolutely. Okay, from Ying Yi Tiao. You should also, you know, like no one, sorry, no one really criticized, for example, the fact that Zoom g gained a huge market share through yeah. the pandemic, you know, like, and, you know, Zoom was the main software uh, adopted by multiple schools around the world including Ivy League schools, you know? Um, and at the same time, you know, like students, they were forced to be on Zoom, but their tuition was not changed or, 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 or made smaller. So in a, in a conversation that I had with the GSD at Harvard, I said, I mean, guys, you should really ask Zoom to compensate for your tuition, you know, because they really gain a huge amount of money. So uh, it's, a, it's a stupid anecdote. I, under, I completely understand that, but I think we need to understand also what is really the political relationship that these platforms imply in you know the conversation or the forced conversation that we are we are we have been having through the past month and we are having now and of course issues of privacy and uh, malware that this all of course of course yeah um so another question ipo mentioned his reason for leaving ome was the limitation in the model itself towards adaptations what attributes come to mind for new models? May they be businesses, projects, structural to allow for more adaptability? I'm not sure if you mentioned. What's the question? What, what new models could be more adaptable for business projects? I mean, I think, I mean, we, I, I, for my experience, we are moving into an economy of fragments of smaller projects, small steps, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to take these huge risks or huge investments that uh, offices like OMA enjoyed through the 80s and the 90s, you know, I mean, we, we live in a completely different historical moment. So size is a huge question for me. Um, and models of 500 plus architects, uh, they might be efficient, but I don't see them to resist on a longer term. They need a huge financial um, uh, support in order to, to keep on working. And uh, I mean, you can just read articles around what's happening now during the pandemic, what's happening to huge architecture offices that are all suffering immensely. So scale is an issue. And um, in my opinion, but I already said it, I think also platforms need to be as transdisciplinary as possible in order to basically, you know, you, you, you can do architecture with a material scientist, you can do architecture with a policymaker, you can do architecture with a filmmaker, 
But the point is that I think you can do better architecture if you present yourself in combo with other disciplines or in dialogue with other disciplines. And I totally understand it took us a long time to set it up, really a long time, long thinking to set it up. But I think there is definitely market for this kind of, sorry to call them queer model, but maybe more transdisciplinary models in a different definition. I hope so too. Um, from Charles Makankeva, um, two questions in relation to the Russian pavilion. One, are you building a world or a possibility of worlds? And if the pavilion is an archive of, and for future usages, then using the metaphor of delivery drivers being part of a digestive system, what type of digestion are you hoping for? Who are the digestive agents in this pavilion that is an archive? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Taos. Um, I, I think we are building possible worlds, so there is not one single vision, and I think, uh, or not single statement, and that was, I understand that that's a little bit of a complicated attitude to have, especially when you curate something that is so specific like a pavilion, but that's something that I tried to clarify since the beginning this would have been a chorus of voices or a chorus of position as opposed to a single position or a single statement or something that could be defined by a single statement. And as in terms of um, um, who are the digestive agents, um, partially it's any kind of, it's the audience of the platform, if there is any, obviously. Um, hopefully, at least the way I see it, the platform is a sort of a preparatory, um, moment in a way to the digestion that will happen uh, next year. Although um, somehow there is always a need to um, pack finished projects, I'm totally happy to keep the suspension of the platform, to basically keep the archive open. The platform should continue to operate through the next editions to build up basically on uh, this longer temporality. That's the only way that I think we can turn this from an empty shell into an actual institution. That's great. Are there any last questions? I don't, oh, one, one last from Marco Venri. How about clients? What would be the steps to build up a network of clients to get into this more adaptable way of practice? That's interesting. Uh, uh, to be a lot of clients to get into more of way. Okay, yeah. very interesting. Uh, I think there is, I discussed this with um, a school in the US, UCLA, precisely this question. Um, and I think it's a question of alignment. We are a sustainable platform, meaning that I run on a financial balance. Um, we pay all our stuff. Um, and we only take projects that we can support that are sustainable. It is very difficult to find clients that basically have that kind of vision. But it's possible to find clients to align with and to bring them from project to project where you actually want to go. It's not easy at all, uh, but I do think that a lot of companies, a lot of clients are really rethinking their own models at the moment. That's why I was talking about opportunities. No one, I think, is completely ready to say, let's go back to normal as nothing has happened. Uh, many things have to have to change on multiple levels from communication to research to physical presence. In our case, um, before setting up 2050 plus, I worked almost one year on finding that alignment. And it was one year of conversations, presentations, lunches, you know, in Italy. Um, and, and trying to basically find a common ground where they could see the potential of working with a practice which doesn't deliver just architecture, but they could also see especially, you know, the advantage of working with in, in that way. 
Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound too optimistic, but it's not unreachable. It really, it really, it's not. And I was really, really tired to work with huge developer at OMA to work basically with people who don't give a shit except branding their project with a big name on the, on the door. That's, that's a criminal attitude, I think. And we should really reject that attitude as, as a community in a way, as, as an architect community. I mean, um, maybe just to close, you can just tell everyone what 2050 plus means, because I think that's a nice uh, yeah, well, closing, what the name stands for in, it's, the of the project. in theory, it's the, um, it's the year, well, one is the year I like to stop working. <laughs> Second, but then it's a plus, so you don't know, yeah. Second, it's the year the Green New Deal should be implemented, uh, both in the US and in Europe. And also it's a year where a lot, a lot of, you know, the world will, is measured against two dates, 2030, which is really close, maybe too close, and 2050 in terms of uh, many parameters. So we wanted to give to the agency, uh, to, to, this, to the platform, a sense of urgency and agency as well. Um, and the plus is about hope, whatever is coming after. Hopefully it's a good thing. Yeah, so. Thank you, Ipo. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that's joined us here from thank very you. far in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Sophia, and thank you, Ipolita, for this amazing talk. And thank you, everyone, for watching us tonight. The video will stay on our social media. And please visit stroko.com to find out about our future events. Bye.